today we're going to be talking about electron configurations and as always we're going to start off with that essential question. So our TEEK is students will be able to explain the purpose of and write electron configurations. So go ahead and turn that statement into a question and then we're going to go ahead and get started. So electrons like to be very, very specific about where they live inside of our electron cloud. They don't actually just fill orbitals like you've seen on Bohr models. They have very specific homes that they like to go to. And so those homes are represented on the periodic table. You can figure out exactly where each electron lives based off of what electron you're looking at on the actual periodic table. So here we have a very uh, shortened periodic table and we have the different orbitals within the periodic table highlighted in different colors. So first we have the S block, we have the P block, we have the D block, and we have the F block. Now something to note is that the S and the P block are both going to match energy level for uh, the actual row that they're in. So row one is gonna be S1, and then row two, 2S, 2P. My D block and my F blocks are a little bit strange in that they do not follow this uh, general guideline. They are less desirable of places to live, so they have a lower energy level that they must maintain inside of them, so they actually start at lower levels. So this 3D, even though it's in the fourth row, it starts at 3D, and that's again because we have a lower energy to maintain that D block level electron than we do for that S level electron, even though they are in the same row. So they are denoting this less energy by uh, denoting the actual orbital level. So here we have uh, orbital notations for each block, what it will look like when it is completely full. It is important to note that those one pronged arrows are actually my electrons. They can either be spin up or they can be spin down. They are each arrows with one prong, but each block is going to hold two electrons each. And then based off of how many total electrons that the suborbital contains, then we are going to expand the number of boxes so my S block in 2S, I can only have one, two before I run out of S block. So since I can only have two electrons in my S block, I only need one box since one box can hold two electrons. So I have a spin up and a spin down in that S block. In my P block, I have a total of six electrons that live within the P block and each box can contain two electrons, which would make me have six total electrons, but three individual suborbitals within that P block. My D block of electrons can uh, contain four, uh, bleh, contain 10 electrons. And since I have 10 electrons and I need uh, one box per two electrons, that would get me to five total boxes here. And then I have my F block, which has a total of 14 electrons. I need one box for every two electrons, so that would get me to seven boxes. Now, the electrons fill the orbitals in very specific orders. Again, we go one by one and they are going to assume their assigned places and they're gonna follow three main rules for how they actually fall into their assigned places. So the first rule that they are going to follow is Hun's rule. And Hun's rule simply states that electrons must occupy empty orbitals first before double occupying them. So we saw up here that the electrons are double occupying, meaning that I have two in each box here. This is a completely filled one, but the electron's preference is going to actually be alone inside of that box. If they can do it, they will do it. My next 
uh, rule is going to be that off-bow principle. My off-bow principle states that electrons must occupy orbitals in order of increasing energy. This basically means that I am going to have a strong preference for lower energy orbitals, if at all possible. I'm going to want to expend as little energy as possible, which means I will fill the lower energy orbitals as in 1s before I ever get to something that's much higher energy as in 5p. My next rule is going to be the Pauli exclusion principle. My Pauli exclusion principle states that electron spins must be the opposite within the same orbital. So again, we saw up here inside of each box that I have both a spin up and a spin down electron. I have to have opposite spins meaning one up, one down, if I'm going to be seated next to another electron. They don't like each other, they have to face away from each other, they must have opposite spins. So, we're going to actually look at the three different uh, notations for electron configurations now. The first is called orbital notation. This is the most time intensive electron configuration, but it is the one that reveals the most amount of information. So it's actually the most useful when we are predicting what is going to actually happen to those electrons and how an element is actually going to respond in a bonding situation, but it is, again, the most complex. So here we have the different suborbitals, and I have each electron placed exactly where it's going to live. So my first and second electron live inside of 1s. My, my third and fourth electron, 2s. My fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth electron live in 2p. My eleventh and twelfth electrons will live in 3s. My thirteenth, my thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth electron will live in 3p. My 19th and my 20th will live in 4s, and then my 21st, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th electron will live in 3d. You might have noticed that I was pointing to electrons in order of fill, so that means I was skipping over electrons, and that is because they do prefer to sit alone. Remember that I am going to be following uh, Hun's rule, which means that I'm going to be filling the empty orbitals before I ever double fill, so I will fill like this. Now orbital notation again is going to have the most information in it. It is the most helpful for predicting what is actually going to happen with bonding because we can actually see the empty spaces where electrons can go, but sometimes we don't have time for that and we are going to use a shorthand notation. So this is actually the exact same atom as we saw for orbital notation for our shorthand notation, this instead of actually seeing the electrons, I'm just straight counting them. So I have the same orbitals here, and my electrons are going to be denoted by the purple numbers. In 1s, I have one, two arrows, so I wrote 1s, 2. In 2s, I have one, two arrows, so I wrote 2s, 2. And so on and so forth until I got to 3d in which I only have four arrows, so again, I wrote 3d4, rather than the full d orbital, which can hold 10 electrons. Up until this point, up until the point where we actually have um, our last electron from that atom, we are going to just go ahead and rely on that those orbitals have to be filled, so they will be to the max. My last uh, notation for electron configurations are my noble gas notations. My noble gas notations are going to take the nearest noble gas and say, hey, you know what argon looks like in our case? Well, argon's perfect little electron configuration, yeah, that. Plus, and then I'll state any electrons that argon does not have. So argon does not have any electrons in 4s or in 3d, but chromium does. And so argon is up until the 3p6, so this is all overtaken by just me saying bracket argon bracket. 
and then I just have to restate any electrons that are not accounted for within the argon electron configuration, which is just 4s2 and 3d4.